I'm recording it. Um, uh, on your side. Okay, that's great. So just send me uh, whatever you've recorded afterwards. Then. Yes, no problem. Okay, well, okay. Um, I'm just going to stick to the script that I sent you a couple of weeks ago. Um, so yeah. It'll be pretty straightforward. Uh, let me just pull that up. And I might want to use the whiteboard. So let me figure out how to share a particular window. Uh, um, yeah, there is um, a, a button for that. And the, um, um, it's that like screen sharing. Yeah, it's the top top left uh, of that window, the um, play button. I think that shows shares the screen. OK. Uh, the top level have you, have you got you've got that control panel have you yeah but but you're the presenter so i'm not sure uh, how to share my particular let's see you make me presenter Right, it's your screen. <clears throat> okay, not what we want is it? Uh, let's have a look. Oh, okay, I can I can make you presenter here. Yay! Yep. Okay, now you should have. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yes. So, um, let's see. Uh, just a window, QuickTime Player, uh, and there we go. This should work. Um, just a second. Just let me make sure that. Can I both show my screen and my face? Um, <clears throat> I f I right, think, this, this is uh, the webcam. There you go. Yep. Yeah, now I can see it all. Okay. Cool. That's great. Yay. Let's get started. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> okay, so, well, just to recap then. Um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> sorry, a bit of chest infection. Um, no, it's fine. Um, you know, the premise of the uh, fourth industrial revolution in general, and so this whole series um, is just that, you know, we're going to live through an era of revolutionary change as a result of various technologies. This, this episode is just specifically focused on democracy and how the infrastructure of democracy um, and our norms are likely to be changed by new technologies. Um, so mm -hmm. I guess <clears throat> the first question is just, you know, I assume that you would agree with the premise that that will happen. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's already happening and it's already happened. So it's difficult to um, disagree with something that's already happening. Do you, could you just elaborate on, um, I guess, how you see that um, trend developing? Right. I, I don't think it's a um, single trend um, to be very precise. Um, I hope the screen sharing is still working. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, great. Right. So um, I think, um, like, for example, currently in Taiwan, citizens' expectation is already at the time where if they get 5,000 people to go to this e-petition site, um, now many of the other countries e petition site mm -hmm. like they above a certain threshold they get a guarantee response from a certain minister or a director of the office right that's the end of the expectation or if they want to build a death star or something they get a very humorous response but still um just a, a single written response from a, a office right but in taiwan people's expectation is that this e petition will be put to, to vote by all ministries' uh, representatives. And this uh, vote 
is actually after a very thorough discussion process of uh, the merits of the petition. And this discussion and vote itself is radically transparent. People can read the whole thing on a public website. And after voting, if the petition is nominated for collaboration, if it's a regional petition, for example, in one of the rural areas in Taiwan, the southmost part of Taiwan, or one of the offshore islands and so on, they may petition for, um, they already did petition for a um, station of the helicopters as ambulance because their closest large hospital is 90 minutes away, for example. Uh, and for cases like that, we fly, well, we take uh, high-speed rails, everybody here, all the relevant ministries and the local county people and everything to their region um, and have a regional forum uh, in which we use a lot of um, AI or machine learning or automated technology to gather uh, the 8,000 uh, people's sentiments into a rough consensus. And so this is a collective um, fact-finding process where we try to get the dissent as data uh, going so that uh, people can see on um, a uh, shared whiteboard what all the different ministries and all the different city level counties have on this particular case and collectively find a decision. And now all this is not only a published as a transcript, but it's also live streamed. And it, there's also an online whiteboard uh, of the mind map and so on. And after this is done, this is for example, a Friday, uh, the next Monday, uh, I'll just bring this to the prime minister and then uh, for the prime minister to ratify uh, one of the accepted solutions that we uh, achieve rough consensus and declare it national policy. So this whole process just takes a few weeks to complete and people kind of take it as granted now um, after a year of, of doing this. And now we're ratifying this whole process. Well, so what, what I'm saying is that future is not evenly distributed, but in a sense, it's already there, that is what I'm saying. Yeah, I mean that is amazing. <clears throat> so is that so? So five thousand is all it takes for, and and that is, um, I mean that debate is taking place at the national level. That's not a yes a local level, um, right? Although it's a regional case, yeah, the debate is uh, <laughs> taking in a national level. We also have national cases like people complaining that there are AI-based chatbots on Facebook scamming the most gullible people into buying things at a discount, but actually not delivering. Uh, the goods and it's impossible to return it. Now, this is a very simple problem statement, but it actually spans like seven different ministries. And and so the, the debate always has to happen on a national cross-ministerial level. And what what is the involvement of the responsible ministers in the, in this process? I mean, are they just sort of right. of it? Right, so, so basically um, the ministers work on the policy mm -hmm. and I work on the process. It's, it's very different. Um, I, I ensure that instead of each minister replying to the petitioners or the protesters saying, you know, I can only handle 5% of what you want, the other 95% is outside my purview, uh, we get all the participation officers who directly respond to the CIO of each ministry to the same place and basically um, make sure that everybody knows what their responsibilities are and uh, in the process contribute what they know about this particular process. So the minister is for both um, discovering the initial facts, for appointing the participation officers, and for, of course, implementing the policies once it's declared uh, feasible by the, all the stakeholders involved. So it, they have many roles in this. And uh, my primary role is just to make sure everybody's in, in the same place, <clears throat> on the same page, so to speak. I mean, you, you've seemed to have been able to achieve a lot in a short space of time. I mean, I, I, would have, I would expect something like that here to encounter a lot of resistance at the ministerial mm -hmm. level. I mean, because, you, mm -hmm. you know, you can obviously interpret it from their point of view as a diminution mm -hmm. of their, you know, their, their power, can't you? No, not at all. Not at all. Um, it, it's a diminution of their risk, right? Because um, the risk is, is spread. Uh, all the responsible ministries in this regard. And the time they could have taken to explain that it's mostly not their job is instead taken to actually solve the issue. And um, uh, for example, on the, on the Facebook um, 
like automated uh, combat uh, case, um, we, we actually, so this is the real-time board. Can you see it? It's mostly Chinese, yeah. but okay, great. So um, from the left, um, so we have the Consumer Protection Agency, the Ministry of Transport, uh, because it uh, involves the delivery of trucks and whether they require um, the sender to fully uh, have authentic uh, contact details. And the taxation, there's Ministry of Finance. And of course, there's also Ministry of Economy because it's about e-commerce, about fair um, competition, about Ministry of Interior, in charge of police, and the central bank. Um, and so instead of you know all seven of them just taking a little part, we actually um, get it into many different subtopics on which every minister can act um, as like fully responsible because we just now let everybody know that it takes all the parts, but for every part, they are actually really responsible. And for the career public servants, it actually reduces their work because otherwise they have to respond to individual MPs repetitively. They have to respond to individual protesters in repetitively. But now because there's 5,000 people e-petitioning, it's essentially 5,000 people subscribing to our newsletter. And once we publish this picture, uh, like at least 5,000 people get the same picture. And if we charge, for example, um, that Facebook should be more diligent in uh, like joining the local business association of e-commerce and uh, making sure that uh, the authorized or the verified um, merchants actually gets uh, a better like advertisement placement or at least uh, less chance of being flagged as inappropriate advertisement they actually now have the mandate from the people that says, okay, now this is internet governance stuff. Um, the minister can talk to Facebook demanding this, knowing that it's what people want on this particular regard. And actually last week, Facebook did join our local business council uh, on this particular uh, reason. And they joined saying, okay, we'll look into this. So this is a like semi-diplomatic um, uh, way of doing dealing with semi sovereign entities like Facebook also for cases like this. It's, uh, it, I mean, is as far as you know, is this, um, I've spent quite a long time looking at this now. And um, I mean, your approach seems like the most uh, advanced one in the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, is that mm -hmm. fair to say? Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Do you, have you had a lot of interest from other governments in, in what you're doing? Right. Well, to be completely fair, uh, the, a lot of the, the tools and um, thinking we use actually originates from the UK, right? Uh, the idea development we took from the policy lab, there's a lot of insights we took from the e-petitions uh, in UK and also uh, on GDS and so on. So it's not that we are particularly innovative on any component. We mostly use the component that's well developed and even proven by people in Iceland, people in Madrid, people in you know the USDS and, and so on. But I, I think uh, our contribution are twofold. The first is um, we, we make it regular. It's not something that the prime minister want, not something the cabinet office want, but something genuinely um, the career public servants see as reducing their risk and saving their time. So, so this is um, a approach that involves more simplification of administrative work instead of the highlighting of a certain prime minister. So this is our, our first contribution is we, we posit all this AI stuff, all this augmented reality stuff, all this collaborative ideation stuff as time save us. And it's actually welcome. So that's our first contribution. The second is that we uh, see ourselves as a fact finding, essentially a consultancy uh, not just for the administration, but for everybody, including the MPs and local city councillors and local city governments. And that solves a, a issue where always in cases like this, the resistance is actually not necessarily from the national government level, but from the MPs and the local governments who are even more likely to think about this as taking their power away, right? But because we focus on the fact finding and the reflection phase and does not at all move into the decisional power there's no e-voting, there's no showing of hands or whatever, right? So so this is as seen as a um, a welcome addition to the um, normal process that they, they do their job. So during the WCIT, during the Civic Tech Fest, uh, I think those two process improvements are the thing that the other, like Epilab and other 
uh, organizations see as most compelling. It's not that they have to learn or do something new. It's just their position um, could be different. So, I mean, just to be clear, then you, you're not saying, well, is, is the long term vision in your mind, um, you know, could you imagine just doing away with the parliamentary body? Well, I still think we need to have full time people working on making sure that the legislation doesn't contradict each other. But uh, I think, of course, on the long term, it will be a co-creation model, like even on Wikipedia. There is a cabal uh, in all the anarchistic society. There are, you know, uh, alumni networks. Um, it, it, they may not call themselves, you know, the powers that be or the parliamentarian or representatives, but there are real needs of full-time people to ensure the consistency of the, the system in general. It's just instead of them deciding everything, uh, it's that we can crowdsource the materials that they need uh, to make make sense of all this. So it's like in a uh, large system, maybe we can say now that the designs evolve or collaborated, but in the end, someone needs to hold the design vision. And uh, I think there's still a, a room for the MPs to do that. I mean, are they the right people to do that? I mean, in, in, in a system such as your building? Why not? I mean, um, we can save a lot of their time uh, by gathering the consensus and the public fact finding. But because they already have a place to debate in the public and also a well accountable system of doing the, the proceeding, um, I, I don't see any, anything should really change. Uh, in the way that they, they do things. Maybe there will be people who say, but uh, I want to vote for this person around this regard and so on and argue for the liquid democracy, right? And maybe people will argue that for certain cases, it makes more sense to have a random sample of people instead of uh, elected officials who, you know, who are not that representative on the variety and so on. And these are valid arguments, but I think uh, a, a empowered place for doing debates like this whether we call them MPs or not, I think it's still very valuable. So, <clears throat> and the, the chief thing, uh, the chief distinguishing feature for them being that, you know, they're voted, they, they, have, a, they have a mandate that stems from the ballot box. Mm -hmm. Right, but, but I mean, the ballot box could be in any shape, right? Yeah. In a liquid or delegated democracy, you essentially have 10 different ballot boxes, one for each area of interest and in participatory budgeting, you essentially have the ballot box uh, in the sense of dollar like programs and so on. So the ballot box itself is just an information gathering device. Of course, you can argue that by having a winner pass the post, whatever, winner takes all uh, design, there's not efficient bits, right? It's not sufficient bits to do decisions. And I, I would agree with that, but uh, I mean, all the other ways are essentially just variations on the same thing. Mm. Um, looking outside Taiwan, I mean, you might feel that you don't want to com comment on outside Taiwan, but um, I'm just interested in, you know, what you see as the chief, um, the most immediate flaws in in other Western democracies systems. Well, in, in, I would include Taiwan in that. It, it, it's is the well, as the WEF report itself uh, said, right? Is the disempowerment, uh, right? And disempowerment is like mistrust, right? Let, let's just take a variation on that, right? So um, the, the same idea, right? Uh, there is now social media. There is a very good um, way to find like-minded people, even if you feel alone in your neighborhood caring only about the thing you care, right? There's chances are you will find a community no matter what uh, online. So that leads to like what we call swift trust meaning a quick trusting of strangers just because you share the same keywords or the same meme or wear the same badge, whatever. And, and that leads to a sense of empowerment. The reality is, of course, that to actually effect change and social production takes much more than the superficial connections. So, uh, and uh, the lobbying and whatever, if it, it doesn't connect to the um, decision-making process, then the empowerment turns into a sense of um, helplessness and that's the disempowerment and that engenders this feeling that the government is so far away from the actual needs of people. Although the distance haven't really changed, but the distance between people have 
like reduce so much that the subconscious are overlapping, it's like negative distance. So in this sense, the feeling between the citizen and the governor are felt to be so large that the mistrust uh, is now very easy to happen. And, and so this is just a side guys. Uh, I don't think Taiwan is exempt from this. Um, <clears throat> I mean, of the various things you've implemented, what is the, um, what do you consider to be the most successful remedy for that? I think the most successful remedy um, is that uh, we systematically reduce the fear, uncertainty, and doubt um, of the, the very, the words uh, civic participation. Um, because for, for many career public servants, even in the administrations that even have a civic participation in social innovation office, um, the career public service not necessarily see this and think hey, this can save me time and this can reduce my political risk. Mostly the career public servants see it very differently from elected officials. They see it as something that's time consuming, that's potentially risky, and that uh, engenders uh, fear, meaning that my power could be taken away. Uncertainty, meaning that this technology, could it really work? Doubt, meaning that, you know, culturally, this is just not the way we do things. And uh, I think over the past few years of our work here in Taiwan, now the national level and city level career public servants see civic participation and think okay this is just something that happens every friday or they think that okay this is just you know part of the uh, administrative process so instead of achieving any specific achievement i think the general culture of the public servants on civic participation there's virtually a very low level of fear uncertainty and doubt i think that's our main contribution and <clears throat> of the um, various things you, you've tried so far, what do you think, um, I mean, could you, if you were to write a playbook for people, uh, mm -hmm. innovators out there who want to implement mm -hmm. you know, technology in their democracies, what, what, would you, mm -hmm. what would your headlines be? Well, my headline would be that before expecting the people trusting the government, the government need to unconditionally trust its people. That would be the headline because it's reciprocal and someone has to move first and certainly the government have, is the one that has the, the the worst track record compared to other civil society actors and so i think the radical trust need to start from the government and the government need to start from career public servants mm. um can you just um can you just talk through the, the the example I've read most about is, is your is the Uber your approach to Uber? Um, yeah. Do you, do you feel like is there a reason why that's been so high profile? Or, or you know, do you well, feel yeah, yes, of course, because um, I think the the Uber case is really um, interesting because it's not about the consensus that we eventually reached. Any academics that research this TNC stuff can write more or less the same recommendations. Um, the main difference is that the Ministry of Transport acting on this consensus now knows that it has a better PR angle than Uber itself. And I think it's, it's a remarkable success exactly because in many other jurisdictions, Uber is decidedly on the upper hand when it comes to PR. But uh, through this process, we, we are able to show that we're more transparent, more accountable, and respond faster than a Silicon Valley company, which, which is why it is made a flagship case. Uh, but if Uber only operates in Taiwan and not in other jurisdictions, there's no comparison, then I don't think there will be this, man, this much international interest. Can you just um, you know, give, a, give a brief posted version of exactly what you did with Uber? Oh, uh, certainly. Um, so, um, just a second, um, you can see this, right? So, um, all right, right. So, um, this, this starts at the end of 2014 after the, uh, city level election that put the occupiers into mayors and the previous prime minister resigned and the new prime minister at the time, uh, engineer says that from now on, crowdsourcing open data is going to be the national policy. And starting from the national policy, uh, the new prime minister enlisted um, the help of um, his deputy minister, a engineer at Google, 
director of engineering at Google, Simon, and uh, also Jacqueline Tsai previously at IBM Asia. So um, these people speak the language of civic tech people, like we're the same kind of people, right? And so they were able to reach out to the civic tech community that was very active during not just the Occupy, but actually the mayor of elections afterwards and say, we have a issue here in Uber and I, we would like to crowdsource the solution. So, so it really takes a political will at the national level that want to make this a prime example of effective crowdsourcing in order for this to happen. And they also said in a hackathon, said uh, the minister at the time said, we have no idea how to run this. So you're going to come up with the process and we agree to bring all the ministers um, on board if you can come up with a process, that's the political will. Um, so, um, and the special thing about Uber is that it, it's what, what I call, you know, semi-sovereign, meaning that there's actually very little a, um, a national government can do about an app because it's an app and also it's a meme, right? It's about the yeah, belief that algorithm is better than law, can supersede law when it comes to dispatching costs. And once a driver believes this meme, they become a spreader of the meme. Maybe they have driven just a week and decided it's not actually a good job at all and, and quit. But uh, during the course of the week, they would have spread this meme already. And so um, there's a lot of um, memes and PRs and whatever during the time and which makes the factual discussions very difficult. But uh, we believe that a, only a, a deliberation can inoculate people against such um, divisive, like sharing economy is always good or whatever, these kind of blanket uh, beliefs. So we introduced the focus conversation methods. And the important thing about this is that this process is pre-agreed by all the stakeholders, including the taxi companies, the associations of drivers, uh, Uber itself, as well as uh, potential Uber competitors in the co-ops and whatever. And the process is basically four stages. Uh, it's about the collection and publication of all the facts and data are relevant to this case. And then a way to automatically gather people's reflections and sentiments about the same data. And then uh, a way for people to come up with ideation, with possible solutions. And the ones that are ranked highest are the one that takes care of the most people's feelings. And finally, the ratification of the suggested solution. And um, when we introduce this uh, methodology, what we are looking at is essentially a translation problem between the professional language that's used by professional lobbyists on the industry chain, on the academics or individual counselors, as scholars, as well as the administration itself. And uh, because of the one government idea, right, the government doesn't tend to say much when they're still deliberating, but it doesn't prevent the people on the street from talking about this. So eventually people have come to different ideas about facts. And once people, um, you know, in this kind of environment, when the same word doesn't even mean the same thing, like sharing economy, it ceases to mean anything in Taiwan's public discourse, um, then ideas become ideologies. And once you're infected with ideology, you lose access to new facts, right? You lose the ability to empathize with people's feelings. Um, so on a deliberation, the first thing we did was we do a collective fact finding. It eventually evolved into this real-time board thing that you, you've just seen, right? But we, we did a crude version of it using uh, shared bookmarks and directories and whatever. But still, it's very useful because people are able to see that there are collective facts. And then we run a three-week online um, sentiment gathering for the feeling part. So we present people with sense of uh, facts and ask them a few yes or no questions. Now we ask all the different ministries to provide with us one question that they care most. Like the Minister of Finance want to ask about insurance um, and the Minister of um, like um, Transportation want to ask about uh, uh, requir requiring a professional license and so on. And so people can answer yes or no on one of those uh, questions. And once they answer, uh, two things happen. First, their avatar change on the, this two-dimensional principal component map and the second thing is that they see another question in the same place and they would just keep pressing yes or no, yes or no. And so they, their position move. But they also see their Facebook and Twitter friends on the same map. So it removes the antagonism because they see, you know, although people initially have just cluster in the corner, literally like four different different sites, still in each corner, there's friends of yours. 
they're not really faceless enemies. They're, they're, they're reasonable people who just didn't talk about this other dinner. And the other thing is that the positions can change because after answering a few questions, maybe you want to chime in and your sentiment become other people's voting um, methods. So the, the topics. And so as people deliberate on each other's opinions, we see that they cluster to the center by proposing more and more resonating um, sentiments. I think one of the reasons is because we say if you convince a super majority of people, 80% or more, we agree to use that collective sentiment as a way to negotiate with Uva on the ideation stage. So people compete for higher score that resonates with more people across the stakeholder groups. And then we run a live consultation, it's live streaming and transcribed in real time that have the stakeholder basically checking uh, in with people's um, consensus. Like a majority of people thinks professional driver's license is required. What do you think about it? And so on. So of the seven or so uh, rough consensus, we also get the people who, to commit and support. And they know that by not showing up, they will be seen as essentially villains in, in the story, right? So everybody shows up. And so everybody looks like heroes because they all agree with what the, the sentiments uh, have agreed uh, over the course of three weeks. And they're very nuanced as well. And now after we get everybody's commitment, we can now say, okay, now we ratify this commitment into legalese, as long as this accurately represents uh, the things that people have committed to. They can't really take back, back their words. And so then it was ratified knowing that everybody will be on board and everybody is on board and Uber is, is good with that. And I think a, a large part of this is that we, we, we are okay with, with lobbying, but all this is radically transparent and even 360 recorded. And so all the stakeholders get to see every other stakeholder's points, even if they come to visit me uh, personally. So this increases trust over time instead of decreases trust over time. And by the end of it, Uber agreed to play by the new rules. They, they only hire professional driver licenses and also the existing taxi company get to uh, make their Uber alternatives and they're now competing on the same uh, legal framework and so on. So it's a happy ending, I guess. That's that's the story. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, it's extraordinary. Is it is the that ratification process? How does that take place? Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the point here is that for each of the commitments, uh, the ministry uh, now knowing that it's their business, because one of the core issues in the Uber case was that the Ministry of Transport, of Economy, of Finance actually have very different idea at the beginning on how to approach Uber. So there is actually internal dissent as well. But after this process, they're like, OK, so this is what people want. So now the, the you know, the tax paying, the insurance, um, the professional driver license, they all have something to do. So instead of working against each other, after the deliberation, they now work with each other now to bring their relevant parts into the regulatory um, wording. And now the wording is, of course, sent uh, to the parliament for ratification. It took some time. To be perfectly honest, uh, it took um, because of the transition during the um, after the consultation, they finished the first draft, I think, by the end of that year. But then the election happened. So during the four months transition, nothing could happen. Uh, so we only ratify it after the transition of, to the new cabinet, which took another like three months or so. Uh, but it's essentially the same version. It really did not change because um, whether it's the, the KMT or the DPP, it's not a party making decisions, it's people's collective decisions. So it really passed unchanged uh, to the parliament. It just took um, a few months, like seven months or so. The the obvious risk, I suppose, is is uh, you know people who are not very digitally engaged or literate being mm -hmm. left behind. So, um, you know, you must have thought about that. Yeah, of, of course. Um, so we we actually checked the distribution of um, citizen population and the distribution of people who participate in this online process, and we're happy to report they correspond almost exactly right. So if there's no CD like urban rural difference. But the reason is this is unfair because Taiwan is a small island and I think on the WEF uh, network readiness in terms of broadband accessibility were like tied for the first or something. So so people who want broadband access get broadband access and our new president, our current president campaign was internet as human right. So, so there's less excuse of, you know, we don't have internet access 
But now, of course, it's possible that they have internet access, but they they are not. Um, they don't prefer the textual way of engagement. Now, that's actually a cognitive mode uh, diversity argument instead of a network access argument, right? So for this, which is why we adopted AR VR, we adopted a uh, real time board that posted notes, which is why we adopted this ambient computing idea where we take all this recording environment into a town hall, but for the citizen, it's just walking into the same town hall and having a real discussion. So we, we do a lot of assistive civic technology to try to um, make it much more inclusive for people with different cognitive modes than purely textual and PowerPoint. Okay. Um, yeah. Can you just explain um, rough consensus and working code? Sure. Well, I mean, this is one of the, the tenets of internet policy making, right? Uh, it, it's written in a RFC, uh, the DAO of the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. So in, in a sense, that's the political system that was raised in. So I'm kind of like bringing this tribal <laughs> um, innovation into the, the, the larger uh, scheme of things. So um, the idea of rough consensus is that because most of the discussion happens um, with people with very diverse backgrounds, and especially when it's online, if you seek fine consensus, uh, what will happen is that first it draws out the process very long, and also people with the most free time, leisure time, actually always win the argument. But the argument is not worth winning anymore because people have already left because they run out of patience. So the, the idea of rough consensus is that it's, it's better to be roughly right than be precisely wrong, right? So as long as people roughly agree that, okay, this is more or less the case, um, then it's okay for people to start implementing, to start working on technologies that um, uh, embodies uh, this collective rough vision. And then so um, I think central to this, to this idea is the idea of iteration or iterative development. Um, the idea is that instead of like in Wikipedia, right, you publish and then you edit, it was the other way around. Um, and uh, in many um, crowdfunding sites, you first uh, get paid and then you do the work. It was the other way around. And so, so all, all this idea is about release early, release often. So it's okay to have some rough policy out and we co-create or we have a sandbox and then we experiment together for six months. And then after six months, we promise to go back and look at the data, look at the evidence and saying, okay, we need to adjust the policy in whichever way. And I think this iterative process itself rebuilds trust rather than any particular wise decision at any given point. Um, that's the, the main idea of rough consensus is just try something out and then go back and then iteratively uh, refine it. So um, if I had, uh, what I'm hearing is, um, I guess if you were trying to define, uh, okay, 20 years from now, there's been a revolution mm -hmm. in how we, uh, how our democracies look, you know, what is it? Mm -hmm. it? Sounds like it's, you're saying it's really the values revolution is around trust mm -hmm. and the process um, uh, revolution is around um, a much more iterative approach to making, to, mm -hmm. to making law. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a very good summary. Okay, good. Um, oh, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, let me just see if there was um, anything specific else that I should... Oh, uh, maybe I should just ask you to um, mm -hmm. just give a, a brief explanation of, uh, you know, what is your actual role in government, you know, and how you, how you came by that mm -hmm. role and what you see as your responsibilities? Sure. Um, well, my role in the government is uh, called Digital Minister Without Portfolio meaning that I'm, I don't oversee any particular ministry, uh, but I work on cross-ministry communication, mostly. Um, and so my, my role is pretty varied. Um, there is a eight-year plan called DigiPlus, um, and uh, there was, I did a cover of that plan, which I'm trying to bring up. Um, yeah, right. So, so um, the, the idea is this, previously the government would take care of all the different parts of the plan, but we now explicitly say, you know, we take care of disabled infrastructure, 5G and whatever, right? But otherwise, we're just going to improve our own governance model to co-creation and stuff like that. 
But now for the innovation, we are asking the private sector uh, to show us what regulations to change uh, through sandboxes, through co-creation processes. And just this week, the parliament is working on the FinTech Sandbox Act, and we're at the end of the year doing a driverless car uh, sandbox act. So there will be many sandbox acts like that, basically saying for a limited time, a limited place, uh, let's co-create a regulation. And for the private sector to drive the digital economy and for the government to work alongside it instead of on top or on the bottom. And I think bottom up or top down really only makes sense when you're in a military or highly bureaucratic organization. When it comes to cross-sectoral collaboration, there's no bottom up or top down. Those words doesn't even make sense. And then the other part of my work is I'm also the uh, minister in charge for social innovation, social enterprise. So the idea is that for the last mile delivery of the inclusion, we also say actually the local civil society, the co-ops, the NGOs, the social enterprises know better than the government to, to do inclusion to, for example, instead of just providing accessibility services to the disabled people, there are social enterprises in Taiwan that trains the disabled people, empower them into urban designers and who sell their service to the places that actually needs um, you know, accessibility design and through, you know, preferential like hotels.com, but for accessibility uh, needed people, they encourage the whole society to co-create um, stuff. And I think this is much better than the model where the government simply contracts a few inspectioners because they may not have the first experience of the distributed stakeholders. So we try to use um, such social innovation methods and social enterprise on the civil society for to deliver government services and government um, focuses on improving the governance model only. So my role is both to oversee that this whole paradigm shift and also to take care of this very specific small part of how exactly the government internally conducts its business with the help of digital tools. So I'm not directly involved in the innovation or inclusion part per se, but I'm also just working on the process to ensure that the multi-stakeholder model happen. So this is the digital enablement part. And then, of course, there was also all those e-petition and uh, open government participation stuff that I'm working on. That's the main role that I'm having. And what does um, anarchism mean to you in the context of this mm -hmm. conversation? Right, so anarchism just means doing away with any top-down, bottom-up, you know, any hierarchical uh, things. And it also means dealing away doing away without, uh, do with the idea of representation, right? Anarchism is the idea that people should represent themselves directly to each other instead of representationally uh, having somebody speak for anyone else, right? So uh, my work as an anarchist is just to, to dispel the myth that all this process require a governmental apparatus to happen because the process itself is all free software, it's open source, it's in commas. Anyone in any level can just take our toolkit and run it. And which means that eventually people will see that it really doesn't take a government to run this process. And that's the long-term goal. Um, okay, uh, then, <clears throat> that's probably my, the end of my question. I mean, just to be clear, you <laughs> when you say well, there's no government I mean, that would terrify a lot of people. Maybe you could mm -hmm. elaborate on, because you don't, you don't actually mean that there's no, there's no government. Right, I mean, the, the government maybe is then distributed, right? Like for example, if you, like you're, if you're one of those cryptocurrency believers, it doesn't mean the end of currency, right? It means the end of hierarchical top-down central banks, right? So, so, so it's not canceling the, so which is why we, we wrote governance, right? Instead of government, it, it is the idea that people can participate in governance, wh whatever their sector is. Now the government, the state still runs a lot of governance stuff, but we're not saying, you know, we're the one with exclusive right on running governance stuff, right? So this is more like a, I wouldn't say decentralized at, at the point, a multi-central. Uh, thinking of governance models. So it's not the abolition of state, but it's, um, you know, having people who are much more, much better uh, to run this multi-stakeholder process, to design and run the process than just the state itself doing it. Mostly. 
Okay. Um, and final question. I mean, uh, you've been able to run a lot of, um, I guess, experiments over the last uh, mm -hmm. few years. And also it's been an experiment for you personally, you know, mm -hmm. moving into a government role. So what has mm -hmm. most surprised you? Hmm. Right. Um, so, so I run this uh, process explicitly to reduce the fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? Um, and uh, I run the idea of, of radical um, transparency, which basically means all the meetings that I convene, even internal meetings, um, we make a full transcript and have all the participants from all the ministries or whatever edit for 10 working days and then we publish everything on the internet. And, and so far as I know, there's no other national ministry level people doing this. And the, the results really surprised me. I mean, I, I did it to, to show accountability and also to show that it really isn't that um, there's nothing to fear. There's no uncertainty or doubt around publishing the work that we do, right? But uh, once we, I do that, there is a side effect that I did not anticipate. Um, it makes me a very rare kind of politician that is blame seeking uh, and credit avoiding. Uh, so in, in, in traditional public administration theory, um, a, a non-career public servant, a, a appointed politician is supposed to be credit seeking and blame avoiding, meaning that if things go right, it's the minister's credit. And if things go wrong, the media or the people has a way to pinpoint the contractor or the career public servant that actually carried um, misstep, right? But um, in a radically transparent environment, it's the other way around. Um, this is an entirely new idea of policy making, open policy making. So if anything goes wrong, it's of course Audrey's fault because you know this is a whole uh, new system of making things. But when things go right and they did go right, people and the journalists and so on go back to the transcripts and see that this is actually the director general's idea, or this is the very low level career public servant's idea, and they get the credit, right? So, so the, the idea is that um, what we are seeing now is that people become very innovative. They raise points and propose plans that maybe only has 20% of working instead of 99%, because they know that the blame gets absorbed by Peters and especially by Audrey. But if it actually works, um, then they get the credit. So what we're seeing is, is a lot of the same dynamics as when um, similar program was adopted by private enterprises or large NGOs, is that people become much more innovative and much more willing to propose um, to, to engage in risk-taking behavior now that we absorb the risk. And this is very surprising and it's not in any of the public administration textbooks. So that's what I'm also learning. So. Brilliant, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Is there, unless there's anything else you, you wanted to say? Mm -hmm. Well, no, that's, that's pretty much it. And um, again, we can either publish this whole video recording if you're okay with it, or we can make a transcript and if you want to edit it for 10 days. <clears throat> sure. We, uh, no, no, we can just publish what you like. Okay, so just send the video to me and um, you'll be on YouTube soon. All right. Okay. Thanks. Cheers, Danny.